250 years ago in Philadelphia, a dream was born. In a time of emperors and kings, it was an astounding revolutionary dream that we, the people, should choose our own leaders, that they should be one of us. This was a dream born of fire, safeguarded by sacrifice during a brutal winter at Valley Forge. Yet it was a dream that was almost over before it had truly begun. The war for independence had left the American colonies bankrupt. Leaders argued unpaid troops rebelled, and some even cried out for a return to monarchy and for General George Washington to be crowned King of America. But the man who had led an army of farmers to victory over the mighty British Empire made it clear that the only title he desired was citizen of the United States of America. I am at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an idea which to me seems the greatest mischief that can befall our country. If you have any regard for yourself, banish these thoughts from your mind. But when the new nation finally adopted its constitution and it came time to elect its first president, there were no doubts about who that president should be. Only he had such doubts. I fear my countrymen will expect too much of me. I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. In the end, Washington set the most important precedent of all. The man who could have been king stepped down after two terms in office and took his place again amongst the people. By insisting that he was, above all other things, one of us, he made it possible for any of us to dream of serving the nation in its highest office. And one day, sure enough, it came to pass that a man who wasn't an aristocrat aspired to the office of president. Andrew Jackson was a battle-forged frontiersman, and according to his predecessor, President John Quincy Adams, a barbarian who cannot write a sentence of grammar and can hardly spell his own name. To which Jackson merely replied, It's a damn poor mind indeed that can't think of at least two ways to spell a word. <laughs> he may have lacked a formal education, but he was tough and brilliant. Just the ticket for a new nation of Americans struggling to turn a dream into an enduring reality. They swept Jackson into office by a landslide and then descended on his inauguration determined to shake his hand in person. Why, 20,000 country people shove to get in the door, no. track their muddy boots across the carpet. And my dear, they would be here still if we hadn't placed tubs of punch out on the lawn. Washington's elite fumed, but Jackson loved it, for these were his people. He was proud to be one of us. I do not forget that the planter, the farmer, the mechanic and the laborer form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of this country. But Andrew Jackson would wage a mighty struggle to hold that great body of people together. State by state, a monstrous injustice that had haunted the country since its beginning was now tearing it apart. Civil War threatened, we searched deep in our heartland for a leader equal to the ordeal ahead. It was perhaps a vindication of the American dream that we found a plain-spoken, self-taught lawyer from Illinois whose campaign platform could be summed up in five simple words. All men are created equal. I say this government cannot endure 
permanently half slave and half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln's words touched the hearts of reasonable men. And in 1860, we sent him to Washington where he would face the hardest task that any American president would ever face. I know there is a God, and that he hates injustice and slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. If he has a place, work for me. And I think he has. I believe I'm ready. I am nothing. But truth is everything. And with God's help, I shall not fail. April 12, 1861. Fort Sumter. The cannon spoke for war. Bitter, violent, and devastating. shared in the dark days of our civil war. But as the sun rose on a cold November day in 1863, thousands of Americans gathered on the battlefield in Gettysburg to hear President Abraham Lincoln give meaning to our sacrifice. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war, we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.